Hi, my name is Pastor Daniel. I'm so excited you're taking an opportunity to watch this sermon. We believe that any time we open the Word of God, that we have an opportunity to be changed because the Bible is the actual live Word of our Heavenly Father. And we hope that this impacts you in a positive way. A quick word of caution, and that is that this sermon that you're about to watch is by no means uh, the church. It's not a substitute for a church. It's not a substitute for a pastor in your life. The church is not a building. The church is the body of Christ, a group of believers doing life together, worshiping and pursuing Jesus together. In no way should this be any sort of primary discipleship in your life, and in no way should this replace the pastor that somewhere God has called to shepherd you. We hope sincerely that you're part of a local church somewhere. And if you're not, I wanna encourage you to go find a local church to be part of, because for all of the ups and downs and messiness of the local church, the Bible calls it the bride of Christ. It is the hope of the world. And you need to be part of one because it'll help. If you don't know where or how to find a local church, we'd love to help. You can simply go to our website and email us at hello at resurrect.church and we'll do our best to plug you in. We appreciate your time. We hope that this supplementary discipleship impacts you in a positive way. We believe the Bible has a profound impact on us when we allow God to speak to us. Thanks. Theology without doxology, you just have dead, cold orthodoxy, which is horrible, right? On the other side, you have the people who say, ah, forget about theology, I just want to praise, right? But if you have doxology without theology, you actually have idolatry. Well, good morning, everyone. You know what you do on a Sunday when the children's choir or children's kids choir is performing and the parents are up here? You stay out of the way. <laughs> That's what you do. Happy Mother's Day. Um, some of us had the privilege, sadly, my mom passed away a number of years ago and many of us are in that position. Some of us have our moms who are still with us, our grandmothers who are still with us. And um, it is a special day especially uh, in some ways for those of us who maybe had the privilege, like I did, of being raised by a godly mother, um, that her testimony eventually brought my father to Christ when he was in his 50s. So uh, again, happy Mother's Day. I hope that you have something special planned today, and I just glanced at the clock, and I promise I will try to get you out of here on time, because I know how important it is to get to those restaurants or other plans that you might have. But please help me by focusing on God's Word. We're going to be taking a look this morning at the book of Ephesians, which we have been studying as a church now at Resurrection here for some time, as we've done other things as well. And we're going to go to Ephesians chapter 4. Uh, we're going to look at verses 1 to 3. Now, those of you in our Resurrection Church family might say, well, wait a minute, Vance. By the way, I am Vance. I am a volunteer teaching pastor here at the church, and every so often they let me out of my box. So this is one of those times. So let me say in advance, I'm sorry. <laughs> All right. Those of you who are in our Resurrection Church family know that we have been looking at, very slowly, the first few verses of Ephesians chapter 4, and I, my topic is actually verse 3, but in order to deal with verse 3, I need to touch on again verses 1 and 2. And we're going to call this keeping the right priorities, because, guys, that is incredibly important, both in terms of our spiritual walk as well as how we deal with one another in the body of Christ, in Christ's community. Now, I do have an opening story. It's sad, but it's very illustrative of the whole point about why it is so important to keep the right priorities. This is a true story. Back in March 6, 1987, there was a car ferry named the Herald of Free Enterprise. 
It departed from Zeebrugge, Belgium to make a short, few-hour trip to Dover, England. It never made it. In less than 20 minutes after its departure, the massive ferry capsized, as you can see in the photograph. Almost 200 passengers and crew passed away. Why? What happened? Well, in the haste to keep the ship on schedule, the crew departed without double checking to make sure, remember it's a car ferry folks, it takes cars and vehicles in front and the back. Nobody checked to make sure that the bow doors were shut. They were wide open. So as soon as this 500 foot long ship cleared the harbor breakwater, in 90 seconds it flipped over. It's a sad story of showing the importance of having the right priorities. You see, the crew's priority that they had been drilled into was for speed and keeping on schedule. So yeah, they kept on schedule. They actually departed a minute early, which was great. But the priority of safety was not addressed. And that was the end result. Now, all that to say this. Too often in the church, we have the wrong priorities. We make mountains out of what should be molehills. We focus too much upon our finite, narrow mindsets, and we fail to recognize the right priorities, and by the right priorities, I mean God's priorities. What are we supposed to do? What are we supposed to be as God's people? So, Ephesians chapter four, verses one to three is all about getting a reset, keeping the right priorities. Now, let me just do a quick overview, if I can, about Ephesians, because we're about halfway through this letter, okay? First of all, one way to look at this book of six chapters of Ephesians is to remember a book written by a Chinese Christian many decades ago called Sit, Stand, Walk. Three words, Sit, Stand, Walk. Summarizes the entire content of Ephesians chapter, of Ephesians chapters one through six. Sit has to do with standing upon our priorities in Christ, our identity in Christ. Stand has to do with standing in the spiritual strength that Christ provides. Walk has to do with living consistently the Christian life. Also chapters one to three, that deals with, as we have learned in the past, what I'm calling our reality, our spiritual riches, our identity in Christ. What Jesus has done for us and our spiritual wealth that we have in Christ. Chapters four through six, that's kind of the imperatives. That's the commands. That's how we're supposed to live our lifestyle and our behavior in Christ, which by the way, that's what we're gonna be looking at briefly this morning. And then finally, another way to look at this book is to think of the first three chapters as theology, broadly speaking, and then the next three chapters, chapters four through six, has to do with ethics, has to do with how we're supposed to live. All right. Let's go ahead and take a quick look at Ephesians chapter four, verse one, and then part of verse two. So here we go. I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness and with patience. Okay, I'm gonna stop there. Verse one. Paul's status. He tells the Ephesians and he tells us he's the Lord Jesus' prisoner, courtesy of Rome. You see, when Paul wrote this, according to the book of Acts, Luke tells us in a couple of verses in the last chapter of Acts, he wrote this, when we, meaning Luke, Paul, and some of their traveling companions, when we came to Rome, Paul was allowed to live by himself with a soldier to guard him. Literally, Paul was chained to a soldier, okay? 
Skip about 10 verses, verse 28 of chapter 28 of Acts. For two whole years, Paul stayed there in his own rented house and welcomed all who came to see him. So when Paul is saying, I'm a prisoner of the Lord, he really is, all right? Everything he do, does in terms of his movement is restricted, all right? Because basically, he's awaiting his chance to stand trial before Caesar for being a Christian. So it causes difficulties for him, but guys, it also causes opportunities. Here's what I mean. Remember, night and day, 24 hours, he's got a prisoner, uh, he's got a Roman soldier chained to him. So imagine a new soldier comes along. We'll call him Julius. And Julius puts on the chain, and there's Paul. And Paul's got this grin on his face. <laughs> Julius is not so sure about this. And then as soon as the other soldiers leave, and it's just Paul and Julius, Paul says, hello. Has anybody ever told you about Jesus? No. Good, I have six hours. We're gonna talk about Jesus. The guy can't get away. <laughs> Julius leaves. Along comes another Roman soldier. We'll call him Rufus. Hello, has anybody ever told you about Jesus? For two years, he did this. Until Paul tells us in his letter to the Philippians, written about the same time as he wrote the letter to Ephesus, he says, you know what, guys? It's become known throughout the entire Praetorian Imperial Guard that I'm in chains for Jesus. Because over two years, if they kept rotating these guards out, probably at least 700 soldiers got to hear about Jesus. So you can imagine some of these guys were repeats. Hello, have you ever heard about? Yes, I have. <laughs> Look at his command. Walk worthy of the gospel means live out your calling calling is the lord's initiative if you're a christian you had to make a decision to come to jesus but behind that decision is the fact that god called you to his family i love how romans 8:30 Paul gives in a nutshell this whole process of getting saved. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. You get it? It's a package deal. Okay? Now the cool thing about this calling is there's a whole lot of blessings that comes with it. And I don't have time to take you through the blessings that we got to look at earlier in Ephesians, but if you just go back a couple of pages in your Bible or a little bit back on your phone app, it says in chapter one, verse three of Ephesians, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing. And then Paul lists those spiritual blessings in verses three to 14, and then he expands on it beyond that. When we were called and got to experience the beginning of our salvation with Christ, that's the goodies that the Lord has given us. And by the way, we don't deserve one of them. Now, verse two of chapter four, this is what Pastor Daniel spoke on last Sunday. He talked about there are three qualities that demonstrate that we are living out our calling. First of all, humility. And Pastor Daniel did a great job of describing for us what humility truly is. Humility is basically, again, the idea that we're not thinking about ourselves at all. Our attention is focused upon others. Gentleness. The old English word for that is meekness, but sadly, meekness carries a lot of connotations that were not necessarily true of that word when it was first used in the old King James Bible. So instead, we use the word gentleness. Gentleness is basically strength under restraint. Patience. Oh, man. I struggle with that one. Anybody who knows me knows I am not a patient man. I'm better than I used to be, 
But boy, I got a long way to go on that one. And by the way, some of you do too. <laughs> okay? So those are qualities we're supposed to have. And the, what's wonderful is that all of those qualities were true about Jesus. And rather than take you to a gospel passage about that, I'd like to show you a prophecy. A prophecy given 700 years earlier that describes Jesus in Isaiah chapter 42, verses one to four, and you can see these qualities in Jesus as we read Isaiah 42, verses one to four. So let me read it to you. Behold my servant, that's Jesus, whom I uphold, my chosen, in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. He will not cry aloud or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. In other words, humility. A bruised reed he will not break, and a faintly burning wick he will not quench. Gentleness. He will faithfully... Bring forth justice, patience. He will not faint or be discouraged until he established justice in the earth and the coastlands wait for his law. Now, part of this was fulfilled in Jesus' first coming. But justice will not be established until Jesus returns. But the same qualities that we can see about Jesus in the Gospels are those same qualities we will see when he returns to establish his kingdom. So that's verse one, part of verse two. Now let's move on. Remember how I told you at the very beginning we were gonna learn about two priorities for the church? Okay, here's where we start dealing with those two priorities. The first priority is keep showing love to others, okay? So the last part of Ephesians chapter four, verse two, it says simply, bearing, another way to put that, putting up with, okay? Get the idea? Bearing with one another in love. Now in the Greek language, which Paul was writing, he means this is an ongoing choice. It's not something that we decide to do once and that's it. We have to keep deciding to do it. Now, when we make this choice, bearing or putting up with one another in love, what's that supposed to look like? Well, here's a pretty good description from Philippians. Chapter two, verses three and four. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility consider others more important than yourselves. Everyone should look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Great illustration of this is in John chapter 13, the Gospel of John, where the disciples were around the banquet table, reclining, waiting for what would be the Last Supper with dirty, stinking, smelly feet. Because none of them wanted to humble himself to wash the feet of another person because that's what what was required. But nobody wanted to do that because of their pride. So you know who washed everybody's feet? You're right, Jesus, including the feet of Judas Iscariot, the traitor. That's what bearing with one another in love looks like. I remember, actually I don't remember, I was too young. But my parents took me to Hearst Castle. I need to rephrase that. My mom got to go into Hearst Castle. My dad did not. And the reason why my dad did not is because there was a screaming two-year-old toddler that he had to hold and watch for two hours as my mom went through that castle. That's bearing one another in love, okay? That's why the apostle John writes, dear children, 
Let us love with words. Let us love not with words or speech, but with actions and truth. Like what one writer says, love is always specific, always costly, always a miraculous event. There's probably somebody in your life that the Lord has put in your life that you need to love and you really don't want to. You need to. I remember at a church that my wife and I attended years ago when I was in seminary, there was one of those kind of hard to love ladies that was in that church. But everybody needed to love her and she was just a needy person. But that's what bearing with one another in love is all about. It's we make an ongoing choice trusting the Lord that he's gonna use us to touch that person. So that's the first priority. Keep showing love to one another. Now, the next priority in verse three, we'll spend a little more time on. Here's what it says in Ephesians 4, 3. Eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Eager. Remember how bear with one another was an ongoing choice? You had to keep doing it? Same thing for this. Eager is an ongoing choice. It's an active, it's not a passive pursuit. Another way to translate this is we're to be zealous to maintain the unity of the spirit. What do I mean by zealous? Okay, I'll give you a great illustration. How many of you have participated in a Black Friday sale? (laughs) Now I'm gonna put my hand down because I have not. But I have a sister-in-law And as far as I know, she still does this about three o'clock in the morning after she has spent Thanksgiving Day looking at all the ads and advertisements to see where she's going to go. Three o'clock in the morning, she is somewhere in this town in a line with all the other crazies (laughs) waiting for those doors to open, 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 so that she can be zealous to participate in the sales. Eager. That's eagerness. We're to maintain that eagerness. You know what? We were spiritually united to Christ. Sometime, if you haven't read it for a while, take a look again at Ephesians chapter one, verses three to 14. Five times Paul mentions in those verses, 11 verses, five times he mentions all this really cool stuff that's true about every Christian in him. In him, in him, meaning all these things that are true about us because we are in Christ. We received that when we came to the Lord. And then we were also spiritually united one with another, with other Christians, into one body, into the church. And it talks about in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 14 to 18 of chapter 2, how there was this dividing wall separating Jews and Gentiles, and God took that wall out and took these people who frankly hated each other and put them together into one body. But the deal is this, guys. That's where we start when we come to Jesus. We start with that unity. But the deal is, We have to maintain it. And we have to be eager to maintain it. Now, when I was a lot younger, my family did a lot of water skiing. Sadly, I have a little too much poundage now to do that anymore. But I remember we went on a vacation to Pine Flat Lake and a friend of mine, we happened to be the same age, his name was Bill. Sadly, the Lord took him home a couple of years ago, but Bill was learning to water ski. And most people, when they learn to water ski, they have to do it on doubles. So there was Bill, this nine-year-old, being pulled by my dad in our boat. He had his skis And he started off with his skis like this, and then after about 10, 15 seconds, they're like this. And then they're like this. And then they're like this. There's only one rule when it comes to water skiing, and that is follow the boat. 
The way he was going, that was not going to last long. And so we were watching. The suspense is killing me. Anybody got popcorn? (laughs) What eventually happened, and you all know, eventually his skis pulled so far apart that poor Bill did a face plant. Boom. Because he couldn't maintain the unity of those skis. That's what we're called to do. See, the acid test of whether we can maintain the unity is simply this, guys. When our comfort zone and our ministry preferences are challenged or set aside, what then? Will we choose to maintain the unity even if we're not getting our way? That's the acid test. I found this out myself several years ago at this church. I used to, and some of you guys, I won't say point out anybody, but you know who you are. Some of you used to sit with me in a class I taught over there in the chapel for a long time. Well, it came to a point where I couldn't do that anymore because the ministry philosophy at the church had changed. I had a choice. Am I going to accept that new philosophy or am I going to buck the trend? I don't want to do this. But the Lord made it absolutely clear. If I was going to participate and continue to participate and be a blessing to this church, I needed to go along with the flow. And that's what maintaining unity is all about. The challenge comes is when our sacred cow is going to get gored. (laughs) That's the challenge. But let me tell you this. There is an incredible blessing. Incredible blessing. When we trust God and do what he wants us to do. Now there's something else here. Notice he says, maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Paul, if you remember in verse one, he reminded us that he was a prisoner. The cool thing is, is that word prisoner is related to this word that he uses here to describe this bond. The fact that he as a prisoner of the Lord, courtesy of Rome, was wearing a chain. And guess what? We are all bonded together in Christ. We're all chained together for Jesus. Isn't that cool? Because according to Ephesians 4, verses 14 and 18, it says this, for he himself is our peace. And he made him preach peace to you who are far off and peace to those who are near. For through him, we both have access to the spirit, to the father. Are you a source of peace or a source of strife to people around you? Because according to this, we are to be bound together in peace. People should be able to look at us as folks that love one another regardless of our differences. If you skip over just a few pages to Colossians chapter 3, Looking quickly at verses 12 to 15, Paul describes exactly what this looks like. This idea of being bound together in peace. Here's what he wrote. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bearing with one another and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. So as the Lord has forgiven you, you must also forgive. And above all these things, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which you were indeed called to be one body and be thankful So, to review, our priorities, we need to keep showing love to others, and we need to keep pushing for peace and unity. Now, in the time that I have left, I want to walk you through quickly three examples, three examples of how they did this, okay? First of all, over in Galatians, an earlier letter that Paul wrote, Paul had to rebuke Peter, the apostle Peter. 
and he had to rebuke him because Peter, frankly, was being a hypocrite. And so here's what it says. Galatians chapter two, beginning at verse 11. But when Cephas, that's Peter, came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. But when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. Here's what's going on. By this time, both Jews and Gentiles were all together in one church. And Peter was no longer worrying about following all the Jewish kosher rules about what he was supposed to eat. So he was enjoying his bacon, lettuce, tomato sandwiches. He was enjoying his ham and eggs. He was enjoying his sausages. And oh, I'm sorry, guys. I'm making you think about food now, aren't I? Sorry about that. But then when the stricter kosher Christians showed up, Peter pulled back. Hey, Peter, you want ham and eggs? No. You want sausage? No. You want bacon? No. Just bring me a matzo ball. The problem was, was that he was treating those Gentile Christians as second-class people. He was being a hypocrite. Because before these other people showed up and he was worried about what they were gonna think about him, he was hanging out with those Christians. Now he's breaking fellowship with them. Verse 13, and the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him. That's the problem. When we're a hypocrite, a lot of times we influence others to do the same thing. So that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. But when I saw their contact was not in step with the truth of the gospel. The truth of the gospel being we're all one in Christ. I said to Cephas, Peter, before them all, if you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? In other words, Peter, you're being a coward. Peter, you're not showing love. You're not showing unity that we're supposed to be showing to one another in the body of Christ. Peter repented, by the way. If he hadn't, and if this Paul hadn't confronted him, they would have fractured the church. Yeah, they would have had a church split. It can get that bad if we're not careful about bearing with one another in love and practicing unity. Go back a few more pages in your Bibles to Acts chapter six. This would have been several years earlier. The church in Jerusalem was growing like a weed. And as a growing church, they begin to have a problem. I'm looking at Acts chapter six, verses one to seven. This is wisdom in meeting a need in a growing church. Acts 6, beginning at verse 1. Now in those days when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint about the Hellenists rose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. Okay, quick word of explanation. This church was really growing, but it had two segments. You had one group that basically they spoke Hebrew, they spoke Aramaic. They were kind of like the old guard, okay? Then you had this other group of Christians that are called the Hellenists. They don't really know Hebrew, they don't really know Aramaic, they speak Greek. So you had two different groups, all part of the same church, and the problem was is these widows had no one else looking out for them but the church, because they didn't have any family. And one group was being neglected over the other group. And the 12, that's the the apostles, summoned the full number of the disciples and said, it's not right that we should give up preaching the word to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out among you seven men of good repute, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom I will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And what they said pleased the whole group and they chose and there's their names listed. The deal was this. They had a challenge. A challenge to maintaining their unity, a challenge to maintaining showing love to one another. So they handled that challenge, that issue, they handled it openly and they handled it directly. Notice they called everybody together. 
This is not going to be handled behind closed doors. They called everybody together and said, look, guys, our priority is we got to teach the word. We got to preach. We need help. We need more leaders. So seven additional leaders were picked out. And by the way, those seven leaders came from that group that spoke Greek, the Jewish Christians from that Greek background. That's where they came from. And everybody liked the solution. You maintain unity, you bear it with one another in love. And if you take a look at verse seven, the end result was the word of God increased and the church grew. If we handle conflicts like that, God will bless this church and every other church. The key is we have to keep the right priorities. One last example. Go over a few pages to Acts chapter 15. This is perhaps the most important example, so bear with me. Acts 15 is the first conference of the church where they had to call the leaders together and it was because they were dealing with something incredibly important. Read with me the first two verses of Acts 15. This is, by the way, in the church in Antioch, which by this time was the fastest growing church they had, okay? Antioch and what was now northern Syria. But some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Here's the issue. How does someone become a Christian? Do you become a Christian by simply believing and trusting Jesus to cleanse you of your sins, which is the gospel, or, as these guys were telling the church in Antioch that were coming in, do you become a Christian by following Jesus and keeping the Old Testament law? In other words, are we saved by faith alone or are we saved by faith plus works? Look at verse two. After Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension with him and debate with him, that's Luke's way of saying that basically everything broke loose. Because at this point, Paul and Barnabas have returned back from their first missionary journey. A lot of Gentiles and some Jews had gotten saved, and they all had gotten saved by simply trusting Jesus as their Savior, not by trusting Jesus and trying to keep a bunch of do's and don'ts. That's what the letter to the Galatians was all about. Dealing with the very nature of the gospel, trusting in Christ alone. So they had a conference. Let me jump over to verse 6. The apostles and elders were gathered together to consider this matter. And after there had been much debate, Peter, remember him? This is after what had happened in Galatians when Paul had to get in Peter's face and confront him about his hypocrisy. Peter stood up and said to them, brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. He's talking about the Lord used Peter to make it clear the gospel needed to go to the Gentiles. And God who knows the heart bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us and he made no distinction between us and them having cleansed their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why are you putting God to the test? Hear that. When we add to God's truth by our petty little traditions, by our petty little beliefs, we're putting God to the test. We're telling the Lord, hey, I know this better than you do. Be careful. Why are we putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither we nor our fathers have been able to bear? P Peter is reminding them, look guys, we couldn't keep the Old Testament law in our old strength. We can't do it. Can't do it in our own strength. That's the point that Paul made in Romans chapter seven, verses 15 to 25. 
He says there, oh yeah, the law is good. The law is wonderful. Can I keep it? No. But we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus just as they will. And that's what they decided. The gospel was maintained. Now, why are we spending time on this? Here's why, guys. Showing love... Maintaining Christ-centered unity never excludes, never excludes the need to preserve the gospel and important Christian, essential Christian doctrines. We never sacrifice truth on behalf of unity or supposed love. Any church that does that, any group of Christians that does that, is in danger of losing the truths of our faith. So yeah, love is important. Unity is important. Confronting false doctrine is also important. In his very last letter, when he was imprisoned again, awaiting this time execution, this is what Paul wrote. What you have heard from me Keep as the pattern of sound teaching with faith and love in Christ Jesus. Guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. In each and every one of us who has been born again, we have God's truth. We also have the Spirit of God to teach us and to lead us into all the truth. Guys, that is a sacred deposit that we need to pass on to the next generation, just like what's happening in our children's ministry here at this church with that kids' choir. And we were hearing evidence of that this morning. That's part of the faith. Yeah, it includes bearing with each other in love. It includes showing and maintaining unity, but it also includes keeping to the truths of the gospel. Okay, to conclude this, two questions. Number one, are you actively loving other Christians? Keyword there, actively. Because we can all say we're doing it. But is there evidence we're doing it? Are you actively loving other Christians, especially people who are different from you? It's easy for us to love people that are like us, okay? Because we're weird and they're weird the same way. But if they're weird a different way, that's, that's a, could be a challenge. But that's what we're called to do. Secondly, how are you encouraging unity in God's church? Are you praying for it? Are you praying for the leaders? Not just in this church, but if you folks, those of you from other churches, are you praying for your church? If somebody comes and gossips, do you kind of turn a deaf ear to them? God hates dissension. Absolutely hates it. It's one of the seven abominations listed in Proverbs chapter six. We want to encourage Christian unity, Christian love, Because if we do that, God will bless not only this church, but every other church that faithfully teaches the gospel and practices these priorities. All right? We're going to have now a time for folks to come forward if they want prayer. Not just about something from this message, but if you want prayer. We'll have some of our ministry leaders down here, and then after that time, uh, Jessica will come back up and close the service. So... You need prayer, come on down, we'll pray with you.